So I'm going to talk to you about the gamification of personalized learning. And first I'm going to tell you what gamification is not, because it surprises me about what people think about gamification. I was at the Governor's Teachers Network, I think it was two weeks ago. Did anyone go? No. Wasn't that nice? Oh my gosh, that was so nice. And there was someone there that was talking about gamification. And they were telling me things like they had their kids to sign up and go online and look at vocabulary, and they raced. And whoever got done first was the right was the winner, and that was gamification. Or someone says that they have the kids playing board games, and that's gamification. And that's really not what gamification is. Okay. So there's a definition of game gamification. It uses game-like thinking and game mechanics to promote intrinsic motivation. So I am, I just used gamification in my classroom for the first year. And at the same time, I started my PhD at UNCG. And I was learning about intrinsic motivation at the same time as I was implementing gamification. So I thought it would be interesting instead of just jumping in. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I found out Hi guys. So when you're in a gamified classroom, this means that students are acting in roles, making choices and earning points, just like they were in a real game. So basically, it's not that you're playing games, it's that your whole environment is gamified, is what it's called. It is an emerging instructional strategy, one that is currently being used in schools and districts. I know that NC State, one of their groups, um, I think last November or whenever it was last fall, won third place, I believe, in a competition, a national competition. So it's heavily used at universities, and it's just becoming something that's coming into our levels, the high school levels, and elementary and middle. So the first part is going to be a little bit research heavy, so I know you just had lunch, so if your eyes glaze over, that's okay. And then I'll go into how I implemented it in my classroom. Before going into gamification, I wanted to revisit intrinsic motivation. So it's been a while maybe since some of you were in school and maybe you don't remember. But there were some big guys, uh, DC was one of them and Ryan is his other cohort or person that he did a lot of research with. And he defined it as behaviors that are engaged just for the sake of doing it. People are doing things just because they want to do the task. That means that they have intrinsic motivation. And then in 2012, Usher and Cover de defined gamification or dimensions of motivation going further as confidence, interest, value, and relatedness. And basically, they said if you have these things, then you have a motivated individual. So it's our job to give these things to our students so that they feel motivated and they feel ready to, to, to learn, because that's our goal. This all sounds a lot like self-determination theory. I don't know if you can remember that. Do you remember that? So I'm going to talk to you just a second about that. And DC and Ryan said that self-determination theory suggests individuals are intrinsically motivated when these other basic needs are met that we just talked about. Uh, in 2009, these guys went a little bit further and elaborated by saying self-determination theory doesn't just look at intrinsic and ex extrinsic motivation, it looks at what kinds of things that are external motivators that actually motivate people internally. So they kind of split it out a little bit further and did a little more deeper research. And some of us, I mean, you know, we've used stickers and points and different colored ink and all of this stuff for years. We were actually using external rewards. But the problem was, um, let me go back to that, I'll do that in a second. But we've been doing that for a long time, right? So another group, I thought, okay, so we have these kids who are wanting to be in, we want to motivate them, we want them to learn on their own, we want them to be self-directed learners. And so then I started thinking about the today's kids, and these kids are, and you know this, how many of you are at one-to-one -one school with technology? Okay, so we did, we did it last year for the first year, and one of our big problems was kids wanted to get on the games. Mm -hmm. And even though the games were educational games and they came with the tablets and they were okay, you know, our county let them play it, 
it was a big struggle with trying to get them to be off the games when they weren't supposed to be on it. Because it was okay that they were playing it, just not at the right time. Well, this whole thing is about how this group of kids, they are, they're mostly known as gamers. Mm -hmm. And it is something that crosses all different demographics. And it's, it's equally um, popular between boys and girls. So I looked at some research about gamification and about students, and this is what I came up with here with the Pew Research Social and Demographic Trends, and then also with the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. That's a lot of kids playing games. But I will say to you, if you look at the dates, that was also five years ago. So I would think that that percentage is quite a bit higher now. All of this means that our kids today are familiar with gaming concepts, which makes them ideal candidates for gamification. Understanding intrinsic motivation, self-determination theory, and the idea that the kids were ready for this kind of instructional technology or methodology, I thought I could move forward with my class. So there's some support for using gamification. If you have ever played a game, first of all, is anyone in here, is anyone in here a gamer, like video games? Okay. I am not. I am not. And it's interesting because I, I do these presentations, I've done this with my kids, I'm looking into research, and I'm not a gamer. So I, that tells you how well it works. But if you ever sit down and play a game with someone, not even just a video game, but just a board game, just think about how well you get to know that person when you're playing a game. That's true, right? You can see the good and the bad of them. You can see where they're strong. And I mean, it's just the way we get to know people. So if you think about it, and we have these kids doing, you know, wanting to do gamification, and playing a game builds on these things. Socialization, learning, altruism, and a need for accomplishment. Everyone playing in the game wants to go ahead, right? They all want to win. They may not be thinking about winning right now. They might just be move, thinking about moving to the next level as we're going. So these things are wonderful things that are already kind of built into this kind of a theory. And again, back to self-determination theory, when these things are met, intrinsic motivation can occur. So gamification has been used for years. It would be hard for me to find someone in this room who doesn't participate in gamification. And you're probably thinking, I don't. But a lot of you do. If you ever have frequent flyer miles, or reward stays at hotels, or even those little key fobs on your uh, car keys for when you go to the grocery store, all that is gamification. So businesses have been doing it for years, for years and years, and quite successfully. For example, when I'm in the grocery store, even if I'm not getting something that is going to give me a discount, I still find myself sliding that little scan, don't you? Don't you just pull that thing out and just slide it, any, even if you're not going to get anything that's on there? Because in my mind, I know that I might get something if I do this. So I've been trained really well to participate. And that is kind of the idea. It's working really well in business, so why don't we try it in education? All right, so if we're already participating and everybody thinks it's a great thing, what's the problem? Why don't we just do this in our classrooms? And I can tell you that there is a controversy surrounding this big point about gamification because it uses points real or virtual badges as motivation for self-directed learning. There's been a controversy about this. And it has been proven to be relevant to me because on my last interview, one person in the persons of three asked my opinion about gamification. I guess they saw it on my resume and saw it presented, so they asked me about gamification, and I didn't know what their response was going to be. So I just told them you know, what I know about it. And the one person said, well, I don't agree with that at all. I don't agree with giving external rewards. I don't think it's the way we should go. The other person was, oh, great, yes, we're going to go have coffee. We're going to implement this. Let's do this. Let's do this. So it is something that is being talked about now at administrative levels. Um, it, it went great. I got the job, so <laughs> it was nice. Um, but it, was just, it just sort of threw me for a loop that it came up at an interview that someone was asking about the communication. So then I thought, OK, we have a problem. We use external rewards. What is the problem with this? And so I went and looked way back in 1971, where uh, DC found extrinsic rewards undermined intrinsic motivation. 
when you get that kind of a problem with something you're trying to implement, then you really have to stop and think about it again. So this actually, as you can imagine, back in the time when it came out in 1971, it sparked controversy then because you had teachers already saying, well, we give gold stars and we give stickers and we give this. So it was kind of a little bit counterintuitive, I guess. And I'm a teacher. As a teacher, it seemed a little bit odd or off from what I already had been using. And so this was in 1971. In 2001, DC, again, uh, Costner and Ryan, they went and they revisited this again. So in 1999, they did this data, data analysis of many different kinds of studies to revisit this notion that it was something that did not help internal motivation. They did a meta-analysis, and that is when they take an objective and quantitative method for synthesizing previous studies, and they try to get common threads through there, and then the idea is if you can weave them together, then you have a, a strong strand of support. And so this is what they did. The kind of studies they used, they had 120 experiments, and they did two studies. The first was on free choice behavior measure of intrinsic motivation. And that's where they observed people who were during free choice time. What did they do at that time? Did they go over here and work? And did they play? Or I don't know because I didn't read the studies to that detail, but that is what free choice measure means. And then the second study, they had people who just did self-reported interest. And so they had these two different studies, and they researched it to see what what they thought, you know, 30 years after their first um, big research. So here's what they found. Tangible rewards undermine intrinsic motivation for children and college students. So giving up tangible things, points, stickers, and all of that was undermining, with the greatest effect being on the younger children. Verbal rewards had less positive effect on children than on college students. So which is kind of strange, because how many times do we say, good job, you're doing great, you know? So it seems that if you were measuring that, that it didn't have as much of an impact on children and college students. So they went ahead and broke it down a little bit further, and they said tangible rewards significantly undermine. Verbal rewards did not. On the free choice and on self-reported, it tangible rewards undermined and verbal enhanced. So after they broke it down a little bit further, and you look at this picture, it seems that verbal rewards seem to be the way to go with their study. And in fact, they were warning that tangible rewards would undermine. Okay. So this can kind of be, there's something else about rewards that I learned um, as a student. If the reward is something that's not expected, then it doesn't seem to have an undermining effect. So if somebody does something and they get a reward for it, and they didn't expect the reward, it seems to boast, boost up their internal motivation. Expected rewards were detrimental. <coughs> now, here's the tricky question. Let's say you have a, you know, a child, and if you're one of those parents, and say, OK, here's $5, you got an A. Here's $5, you got an A. OK, so you do that. Doesn't that become an expectation afterwards? So I'm kind of not clear about that whole part of it because I think once you give somebody a reward for something, they're going to expect it. It might not be the same reward, but they will expect it again. So I'm not sure how to gauge with that. All right, so then we had at the same time-ish, uh, 1994, five years or earlier, this other group, Cameron, Banco, Pierce, conducted their own separate meta-analysis on rewards and intrinsic motivation. They used 145 studies, and they had the same two kinds of groups, um, free choice and self-reported. And they came out with a different kind of result. They found no detrimental effects of using rewards on intrinsic motivation. They suggested that tangible rewards, rewards can increase an in interest in and performance on low interest activities, mm -hmm. and verbal rewards tended to de increase high interest tasks. So they kind of went the opposite way with this. This seems to go, except that, this seems to go along 
or against what we know as adults because this is sort of like how many of you go somewhere in the summer and you get a stipend? Do you guys do that for PD? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you didn't get that stipend, would you go? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what the PD is about, right? If it's something very interesting or helpful for your job, you'll be there. If it's not, you're not going to go. But if they give you a stipend, you're going to go properly. So this is kind of against what we know a little bit when we talk about rewards, because it works for us, right? It works for us as adults. But this sort of, part of this seemed to support what DC and Costner and Ryan had said, finding that expected rewards might be detrimental to intrinsic motivation. So here's how it ends up. It seems external rewards can be beneficial if the rewards are not expected. Again, good luck with that, because I haven't quite figured that out myself. Um, extrinsic rewards are also to motive, will motivate learners to complete low interest tasks. My experience supported these implications, except for the rewards problem. The low interest task is really interesting. When I implement this in my classroom, I use student choice. So what works for this one kid here, like I might have 20 activities for a seven day period and they come in and they get to choose what they want to do. So this, this person right here might go straight to a lab or something. And this person over here might want to do, I have a lot of kids last year who wanted to do scientific diagrams and things like that and they were very interested in that. So in your classroom, because you have a variety of learners, you have a variety of low interest tasks. Does that make sense? Because what's interesting to this one may not be interesting to that one at all. So because there are, is a possibility of having many different low interest tasks, by adding gamification to it, according to what the study says, you increase internal motivation. Does that make sense? Are y'all still with me? <laughs> Sorry about all this. Great. All right, so now I'm going to tell you how it worked in my classroom. I, like I said, I used student choice. So they came in, and when they signed up, saw on the board where it says game on, they knew we were gamifying. And they knew the term. They said, when are we going to gamify again? Are we doing gamification? And so I would say game on, and I would say like 10 days or whatever, how many days I want to do it. And I would, uh, we had the one-to-one, -one, so I could just push out to the tablets what I wanted them to know as their choices. And then I would give them way more many choices than they could possibly do in the, in the period that we and so they came in and they got to choose. And some of the things were individual, some were with a partner, some were with a group, some was one day, one was five days, another maybe 10 days, and each one is worth different amounts of points. So the kids earned grades, but they also earned points. And they made the choices. And they came in and they said, okay, I'm gonna do this, and then they came and they just grabbed their stuff and they went to work. My only rule was they had to work every day. I didn't care what they were doing, they had to work. This made for a really, truly classroom that had student autonomy. Because they just came in and they went to work. It was, it was really great. Gamification, if you are a gamer, you know that this involves a storyline. And as I talk to people about gamification, some people tell me they write their own storyline. Or they mimic a game, maybe a video game that they play. Because there's a, an element of a quest when you have game, when you play video games. There's some kind of uh, a thing that we're trying to accomplish. So for me, I used um, a book I know very well called The Circle. And I, I use that because of something I know very well, but I've also known other people who use the Divergent series or Hunger Games or any of these books that have, a, it's already automatically set up with teams inside of it or clans or groups of people so that you can kind of put your kids on different teams. So I think Divergent is um, factions, does that sound right? Factions. Okay, and then the Hunger Games is districts and things like that. So for the group that we had, we had different clans of people. So I would recommend that you either, if you're just really, you're really wanting to do this and you don't want to make the time and effort to make your own game, your storyline, just grab a book that you're familiar with. If you're not an ELA teacher, which I was not, I'm a science, then I had my kids read the first chapter or two so they had some understanding of what was going on. But I really would li like to um, integrate this with my ELA people. It would make it so much more fun for the kids. So, one of the first few days of school, I gave my kids that. And 
they read the descriptions and they chose someone which, which excuse me, closest matched their own personalities. I didn't ask, I asked them to put their name on it, you're only seeing a part of it. But I didn't tell them anything else except just read this and put a check beside the one that sounds most like you. So this was the way I set my kids up and they were able to get themselves sorted into these groups. So that was like the first day of school. They didn't, you know, they don't pay attention to what's going on. They're signing so many papers and doing all this. They just, okay, so they read that and then they didn't even ask me about it for a few, like a week later when we were talking about it. But how this worked for me, I was teaching middle school last year. So I had four classes and I gave all the kids the same little inventory, personality inventory. And they sorted themselves into eight different clans. All of these clans were spread out. So if you came into my first period class and you were with ASEA, that was your group, you might have two or three people in here in your clan. And then the next period, there might be 10 or 15. And then the next class, there might be another four or five. Or you can very easily walk in and have no one else in your clan, you know, because they sorted by personality. So it was spread out for the entirety of my team. It was all spread out. And that worked really well too. So in the novel, each of the clans have a keeper. And there are different terms you can use, depending on whatever group leader or whatever you have, whatever storyline you're using. Um, our class, my kids decided that we would have a keeper for a month. And I took it a step further because I wanted the kids to have some self-directed learning. And at the end of the month, I had my keepers come in and meet with me during council. And we talked about, at lunch or something, you know, just something a few minutes at a time. We talked about what worked well. You know, did you like the labs? Did you like this project? Did you, what would you like to see? And so this made the kids kind of be responsible for their learning because they came back and they said, well, this is kind of like what we want to do. We like this better. That worked really well with motivation. I also used a 3D printer and I made little, tan, um, little tiny tokens that represented each of the clan. And, and it was uh, maybe $3. And so then I had, I gave one to the keeper and they kept it. They didn't return it at the end of the month or anything like that. They kept it and they were wearing them on their wrists or around their neck. And this kind of also kind of helped the game propel outside of the classroom because they kind of, they were belonging or recognizing, oh, that's my keeper, that's my clan, and it really worked well. So I introduced the concept of a gamified classroom to my kids after this, about a week later. And I don't, like I said, I'm not a gamer. And I said, I want you guys to help me, let's set this world up here. And so they came up with terms that we were gonna use in the classroom. But giving the kids control over their learning immediately increased their desire to be engaged. They were ready. As soon as I talked about what we were going to do, they were all for it. So here, whoops, here is the board, one of the classes. I did it in all four classes, and then I took the common terms from each one, and I made that our, our world rules. So everybody got kind of got a say in it. So here's some of the things that kids came up. And if you are a game person, then it makes sense to you some of the things that you're seeing here. Some of the stuff they had explained to me, because I don't play video games at all. So some things they came up with, the mission, that would be the goal mastery in teacher talk. Uh, a player is a student, obviously. Um, level up, that's when they complete, when they're finished with whatever we're supposed to be teaching or doing, they could level up on their own and go to a next higher um, learning objective. Achievement get, that is something they said they wanted when they, I guess, to acknowledge that they had performed well or had reached that certain level. Keeper was the clan leader, um, XP. That is the bonus points. And that is how we talked about, they're like, well, what is that activity? And I'd say, that's worth 15 XP. Or, you know, however, and that's how they kept up with their score. There were other bonus things. If they were to use their tablet and do a Skype with their parent in the middle of class, you know, they sit down and say, hey, this is what we're doing today. And they have a Skype with their parent. And here's the thing I'm learning about. You know, and the parent can shoot you an email later and say, hey, that, you know, my, my kid told me this is what you're learning. I think this is great. And then they got points. So there's opportunity for a bonus. They had extra credit, of course, which I gave XP for if they did extra credit. And then there were other things, like they could shoot a video or a tutorial on an objective. Maybe they were really good, and so they just shot a little video 
and like a podcast, and then my other kids can use it. So all these things help them to earn XP, and believe me, they were all doing extra credit, which is wonderful. How many times do you get all that extra credit out, you leave it on the table, and no one picks it up? So this works really well with extra credit. Then over here we have, on the right, we have a leaderboard, and I'll talk to you about that because some people don't really like the use of a leaderboard. Um, but a leaderboard, in my room, it was only by team. They did not have individual scores up. Because I think it, it doesn't motivate so well if you have individual scores. So on mine, they could walk in and they saw their clan symbols. And they could see, oh, we're in first place, we're in second place, or wherever we are. It, what was really interesting about the leaderboard, I kept up with their points, everybody's points on my team. Nobody asked me all year long, what are my points? Not one of those kids cared about what the points were. But all of them could tell you where their team was. So that was motivating, and that was interesting for me to see. There was one group I had, you know, I, I, I tallied them every month, and we changed the leaderboard, and we changed keepers. And there was one group that was consistently at the bottom of the, the ranking for three months in a row. They were dead last. They were my favorite group from the story. <laughs> so was, it was very interesting to me that I kept seeing them down, down, down. And then the next month they came in and tallied the points, and all of a sudden they shot to second place. And I thought, okay, well, how did this happen? Because even though it's student choice, they all have the same opportunities to earn different points, you know, depending on what their choices are. And what they had done was they, they had kind of banded together and decided to do extra credit. Do you know how hard that was? Because you might only have one or two people in your clan in here. And maybe you don't even know a lot of people in that period. You know what it's like if you work in the last day. So in my room, I blend personalized learning and student choice. And this is how it works. So I go in and they have a list. And it says, here's the subjective. And then they pick it out and decide what they're going to do. Plus they decide how long it's going to take them. If I come in and say, okay, this activity is supposed to take you two days and you need to work on it with two other people. If someone comes to me and says, I don't want to work with anyone else, I want to work by myself. I'm like, that's fine. You can work by yourself. You have more work to do. You can work by yourself if you want. And then after two days, you know, the rule is they have to work every day. After two days, they come to me and I'm not finished. Ms. Fuller, I'm sorry, I'm not finished. No problem. They've been working. They get an extra day out here, it takes them 10 days. If they are working on it every day, I'm good. So that's how that works. It's a suggested time of how long it takes something to, to happen. And then I have other kids who were really high flyers. Oh, it takes me a day, you know, or two days. They would get it done in one. But there is never this time where they're just twiddling their thumbs. I'm done, now what do I do? Never. Because you know what they did? They just went and picked another objective. They knew. During this time, this is what you can pick from. So that works really well. So if, a class, look, if there was a 10-day unit, and there was one activity that took 10 entire days, legitimately took 10 days, kids are working on it every day, possibility of 200 points. And they couldn't do anything else. They couldn't pick any of the other 19, because they chose this one. Then that, at the end of the time, they, they got their 200 points, or ever, the points are based on grade. So if they got a 90, they got 90% of the points. And at the end of the time, they can only turn in one thing. So for the other 19 things, I just omitted. Omit, omit, omit. So it didn't count for or against them. If on the other hand, during this seven day period or 10 day period, I thought in my head, okay, well they can easily get done 15 things but someone got 20 things done, because there were kids who go faster. Then the rest of the class, if they didn't get from 15 to 20, they just got omit, omit, omit. So it didn't hurt anybody that the kids were going at their own pace. In fact, it helped a lot of the kids. It really did, because they, they felt they could work and, and be comfortable with what they were learning. And there's this whole other body of research that talks about even the perception of choice is something that motivates somebody. Like if you came here today and you weren't able to pick where you were going, you might not feel as great about going to some of these things, right? So giving you that control, that's a motivator. 
So letting the kids, same thing, come in and choose what they want to do as a motivator. Okay, so I always get asked this question, how did you keep up with this? And the easiest thing for me was um, once the kids were sorted into their plans, I just did a just for names only. I said, okay, here's the SEA, boom, 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 boom. Here's the HOBIA, boom, boom, boom. So I would know who's in what plan. But as far as the points are concerned, I used Class Dojo only for points. I didn't use it for grades, I didn't use it for parent contact, I didn't use it for anything. So in Class Dojo, instead of setting up your classes, first period, second period, third period, I set up my clan names, Asaya, Obaya, Devil's Peak. And I put the kids in these clans. So whenever I was telling, whenever I would grade something, oh, you got a 90, so you got nine points. I would just put a nine, nine points into their Class Dojo. Parents didn't have access to those, just me. That was the easiest way for me to keep up with points because the hardest part about this actually is trying to manage the point system, I thought. And that was easy. That took care of it right away. So I highly recommend that. <coughs> yeah, I just talked to you about how it was point, the points were scored, whatever the grade was, determined how many points they got, percentage of points. So personalized learning, in my room, met a need of diverse population of kids. And giving them the choice made them feel like they were in control. Each student demonstrated, a, some people ask me this sometimes, so what about girls? Girls don't play video games. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Um, there is no gender gap. In fact, when we were coming up with our world rules, a lot of the girls were shouting out terms to me. Creeper, you know, these kind of things. <laughs> put this up there, camper, put this up here. So there was no gender gap. There is also some data to suggest that it helps with some of your at-risk kids because it gets them involved and engaged in school. So that kind of grabs them too. My students were in competition as a group. They saw their rankings, like I told you, on the leaderboard, but they didn't ever ask me for their individual scores. And this just helped me to be able to move from the front of the room and just, you know, there were many days I could sit down and just say, hey, what are y'all doing? And I could sit with this group the whole period. And you don't get to do that all the time, really. You know that. You have certain kids that you have to be with all the time, and then some of them are just kind of hanging out. But with this situation, and they're all working, and they're all responsible for their learning, I was able to move around and do a lot. It was wonderful. Uh, I will definitely use it again. My kids learned about autonomy, the fact that they were already wired with gaming and stuff, like, you know, that kind of turns and stuff, they were good to go. And I had some results um, that were particular to my district goals. I was curious to see how it would work, and so what I did was I did the, you know, the pre-assess, the post-assess, and I didn't change the assessment. I used um, Socrative. Have you ever used that? So you know how you can just jumble up the answer choices and the questions. It's really cool. And so I did the pre-assess and the post-assess, and then I, you know, determined measure of growth by how much better they did. And on average, on my team for the first unit that we gamified, there was 138% growth. 138% from here to there. That was amazing because the kids were engaged. And you know, if you have engaged learners, they're going to learn. So on another point, one more thing I guess I'd like to say, I'm not sure, how much time do we have? Oh, good, good, good. So one last thing, I'm curious as far as research goes after I talked to you all about research, those studies were done in 2010, and I just think if it were repeated now in 2015, we would see a lot other, a, a big difference. Because so many kids are gamifying and so many adults are gamifying that I just think that we would see even more positive benefits.